Hello, and welcome to today's Nonprofit HR and Cornerstone On Demand webinar, Continuous Feedback Performance Model, Is Your Organization Ready? My name is Rachel, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Please note this call is being recorded and all lines are muted. If you need help at any time, please send us a message via the chat or the Q&A box on the right side of the screen. Today's event will last up to 60 minutes. The question and answer segment will come at the end of the presentation. However, please queue up your questions throughout the event. Simply type them into the Q&A box on the right side of the screen and then click send. Continuing education credit is available for this event. You must stay on for the entire event and complete the post-event survey to receive your activity IDs, which will be delivered to you via email. This program is eligible for one hour. There will be an archived recording of this event that will be available within the coming days. And now a little more information about our sponsors, Cornerstone On Demand and Nonprofit HR. Cornerstone is pioneering solutions to help organizations realize the potential of the modern workforce. As a global leader in cloud-based learning and human capital management software, Cornerstone is designed to enable a lifetime of learning and development that is fundamental to the growth of employees and organizations. The company's solutions are used by more than 3,250 clients worldwide, spanning more than 36 million users across 192 countries and 43 languages. Nonprofit HR is the only human resources firm in the country that works exclusively with the nonprofit sector. Nonprofit HR has been partnering with nonprofits and associations for over 18 years to help them maximize the potential of their people and increase their impact. Nonprofit HR offers a comprehensive suite of HR services, including HR outsourcing, consulting in the areas of audit and compliance, education and training, compensation and benefits, learning and development, performance management, culture and engagement, as well as talent acquisition and executive search. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Angelique Lucas is a senior HR business partner with Nonprofit HR's on-site outsourcing team, working with various nonprofit organizations and associations, providing HR expertise to clients from HR strategy and management to daily operational support to help improve the function of HR within the sector. Jeremy Spake has a wide range of experience as a consultant in performance management, compensation, and mergers and acquisitions. Jeremy has served on multiple local and national nonprofit boards and has been actively involved with change management initiatives with those organizations. Jeremy, the floor is all yours. Thank you, uh, excuse me, thank you, Rachel, and thank you everyone for joining us today. We're excited to be here to share with you some interesting trends and case studies around performance management, but also talk about how you might be able to assess whether some of these trends, particularly continuous feedback, might be best uh, utilized and implemented in your own organization. First, I'd like to start by setting the stage with really kind of some macro level trends in talent management that we are witnessing and aware of, particularly around ongoing feedback. Traditionally, you have that one point in time, that one point annual review conversation where managers will sit down with their employees and discuss their contributions and their achievements and their goal attainment maybe over the course of the last year, usually gives them some type of rating, and usually that rating will then translate into some type of compensation action, maybe a salary increase. Now, the tra traditional kind of idea of that one point in time is truly misaligned with how we think about the health of our organizations and the health of our talent. So if you think about it, the idea that you're going to constantly be checking in on pro programmatic health or as new things arise throughout the course of any given year and really focus on maybe making course corrections or changes in a program or changes in how you're going to measure success all throughout the year to make sure that you are continually on track with the goals of your organization as they change and as priorities change over the course of any given year. So the question then becomes really why are we thinking about that differently in terms of the way we manage our people? We want to think about always checking in with our people in case there are issues that arise over the course of any given year. And the idea that someone would go into their annual review conversation with their manager and maybe come out of that conversation surprised is something we want to steer away from. 
I'm sure all of us have had anecdotal experiences or even our own experiences where maybe you've gone into that annual conversation and you've come out surprised by thinking, oh, I was expecting to be rated higher than this, or I was expecting for different type of feedback than I got. And the idea for more ongoing feedback is really to really kind of mitigate that issue. The idea is that if a manager notices some kind of issue or behavioral uh, or performance modification that can be made with an employee, that you address it in real time. No one should come out of their annual conversation surprised. No one should come out of any conversation with their manager when they're talking about their performance surprise. So because managers, again, should be having these conversations more frequently with their employees. And in these conversations, they should be focusing on development. So not only how you performed and how you've achieved and what goals maybe you've attained, but let's talk about what's next for you. What do we see in terms of new programs coming up or new challenges coming up down the pike that you need to be prepared for? And do you have the right skills to make sure that you can be successful as these new challenges arise? So talking with your employees on a more regular basis, talking about their goals, talking about what's coming next for them, but also helping them to really focus on their development rather than strictly focusing on some type of appraisal. A lot of organizations we're working with, too, are really focusing on developing those leaders um, who may be coming up the pike instead of just focusing on the leaders who already exist in your organization. Because you want to think about as, you know, what are your critical roles, and as your critical roles, um, you know, become vacant, do you have the right people who can step in to fill any talent gaps that you might arise? So these more frequent conversations can help you have a better assessment of really who might be able to do that and to focus on the development of those people, giving them development on demand activities. So, you know, you don't want to wait for someone to maybe be here for three years before you can send them to, um, you know, get some kind of certification or pay for some kind of tuition reimbursement or send them to a conference. A lot of organizations we work with have those kinds of tenure-based uh, restrictions to allow for development for their employees. We want to make sure you kind of get rid of that idea because the idea, idea again, is to develop people on demand as they need it and to foster continuous leadership within your organization. And as I mentioned, we have that misalignment between how we think about the health of our organizations and the health of our people, particularly around the, the idea of performance management, right? We always are having that one time per year conversation. We're always thinking about them being very compliance centric and following the process usually for the sake of just following the process. So it's always good to step back and think about what is being achieved by your performance management review process, what is going great right now. Maybe you don't need to change everything, but if you do need to change something, really figure out and assess what that looks like for your organization. What are the areas that are working well? What are the areas that maybe your managers and your employees do not find that's working well and really focus on the areas around that to make it a more productive conversation because the crux of performance management really should be the conversation between the manager and employee and they should be happening on a more frequent basis so that, again, managers have that insight, that pulse check on the talent and the health of your people so they can make course corrections in behavior, course corrections in performance, or drive them to development opportunities as they need them rather than, again, waiting for that one time per year kind of formal feedback loop that's mandated by the organization, trying to get ready for a culture where the managers have these kinds of more formalized conversations frequently throughout the year. So again, no one's surprised by the time that end of your conversation happens and everyone kind of knows really what it is that maybe in terms of skill gaps exist so that you can then actively try to engage learning and development opportunities to fill those skill gaps. But particularly, we want to think about more formal conversations frequently throughout the year rather than that one time per year. So we want to take a pulse check really quickly and really see what is happening in the organizations that are represented here in our audience today. So if you don't have a moment, we're going to do a quick poll here. And I would like to know, really, how often do you currently have formalized performance review conversations between managers and employees? Do you have them annually, semi-annually? quarterly or some other level of frequency. So if you wouldn't um, mind, just take a moment here and on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see that poll question. Please select a choice, annually, semi-annually, quarterly or other, and then click the submit gray button in the bottom right corner of that panel. And we'll see what our um, audience has to say here in terms of the frequency represented in our organizations here. So again, just take a minute and we'll see what those results look like. All right, and it looks like right now it shows that 40% um, of our organizations here um, on our call today do annual reviews 
about 13% of them do semi-annually reviews, 7% do quarterly. And you know what, in, in general, this is kind of in line with market. The bulk of the people that we find in other organizations do these annually kind of conversations, right, 48%. However, this has gone down dramatically over the last few years. I think just two years ago, it was the percentage was in the 70s. So as you see that typically people are moving away from the annual event, the annual event still remains the most common, most prominent kind of frequency level, but we are seeing that push to get them more semi-annually or quarterly or other, and typically when we find is other represents maybe every month, right? We have a lot of organizations who are maybe doing frequently check-ins, uh, frequent check-ins um, monthly on a monthly basis. But semi-annually seems to be the biggest, uh, the biggest kind of alternative to the annual review that's uh, in line with our audience today and as well in line with organizations surveyed by Burson and Deloitte. And a second level of frequency after that would be quarterly. So 9% of our uh, organizations surveyed by Burson by Deloitte say quarterly, and that's in line with the uh, statistics here from our organization today. So again, annually still remains the most common level of feedback and the frequency of feedback. However, that is definitely shifting as that percentage has gone down in recent years um, to really kind of fill in the slots of semi annually and quarterly. So as you think about what's coming next for your organization, as you think about the level of frequency that works right for you, um, definitely kind of consider, you know, what is the continuous feedback model? And for that, I'm going to turn it over to my co-presenter today, Angelique. Thanks, Jeremy. So now that we've talked about trends and what's going on um, in other organizations across sectors, what is continuous feedback model? It's an approach to performance management that looks at, as Jeremy has said, providing feedback throughout a review period rather than typically one time at the end of the year to talk about what happened, how can we adjust to, you know, how does this affect performance, potentially bonus, merit increases, so on and so forth. And it's about providing feedback more regularly in a real-time basis so that you can adjust, course correct, or continue what's, what you're doing well. So other aspects of continuous feedback model include more informal discussions on performance. So typically they're very structured, centralized, HR-focused discussions at the end of the year between manager and employee. A form usually is involved or some sort of input into an online system or tool, and then, you know, a review is done aggregating those results against one another, last year's results, so on and so forth. But those more informal discussions can come in regular meetings, could come, as, as Jeremy has said, quarterly, semi-annually. It really depends what you're doing now on how that shift tends to move um, frequency. Now, in terms of frequency, We've already talked about um, being moving from annual to quarterly or monthly, but it doesn't necessarily have to be scheduled times, right? It could be as and when deliverables are completed, projects are managed specific to an event or a behavior, and timely so that when feedback is provided, a response to how that took place, your response to it can be adjusted at the time. So if we talk about, if we move to the next slide, the logistics of what that looks like, the frequency, it's not a set amount in terms of a continuous feedback model. It's gonna automatically move to quarterly or semi-annually. It really depends what your organization is doing now and adding in more frequent sessions at that point. So if you're at a semi-annual session, uh, review period now, you might want to think about moving to quarterly. If you're at quarterly now, you may want to think about moving to monthly. Typically, monthly is going to be the most frequent. Um, after that, you don't see a lot of movement from project to project or adjustments in behavior, depending on what you're reviewing. Um, you also want to look at making feedback a habit, right? So you've got the quarterly scheduled meetings, but you also have, as I mentioned, when deliverable, deliverables are being completed, projects are managed, tasks are being completed, then having that discussion in real time so that both the person providing feedback as well as the person receiving the feedback can respond and be thinking about what's just happened recently. Also, these discussions really are focused on 
the discussion itself and providing the feedback and the ability to course correct, whether it's behaviors or how a person completes their, their job and essential duties, it's not about the documentation. Typically at the end of the year, the model includes some sort of a form, even if that's a semi-annual process, there's possibly a mid-year form, and that's completed, turned into HR, everyone signs, and it's usually uploaded into the personnel file. That, that is shifting now to really be about building the relationship within that discussion, and there may be a form that leads that discussion and informs it, rather than the focus being on getting that form in the personnel file adjusted and, and ticked ticking that box with HR. And then really, when you're moving to a continuous feedback model, really having champions on board. Oftentimes, individuals or organizations may think that that automatically means that it needs to be HR because HR manages the performance management process, or it could be the leadership, but it's really gonna be across levels um, and really having champions that are strategic about rolling this out, being deliberate about the training and how that's being delivered and getting all levels of the organization involved. So moving on to the next slide. Just a quote here, as, as Jeremy mentioned earlier about leadership and really focusing on whether or not you're in a leadership role, moving into a leadership role. Uh, a great quote here, no matter how good you think you are as a leader, my goodness, the people around you have, will have all kinds of ideas for how you can get better. So for me, the most fundamental thing about leadership is to have the humility to continue to get feedback and to try to get better because your job is to try to help everybody else get better. Jim Young Kim. So in the next one, we'll talk, in the next few slides, we'll talk about some benefits and challenges to moving to a continuous feedback model and what that looks like. Um, obviously benefits, it's going to be building productive relationships. As I mentioned earlier, it's no longer about turning in the form, making sure that that's documented in the personnel file, but it's really about having that discussion, building the relationship between supervisor and employee, as well as um, teams and building collaboration across teams. So if you're providing feedback in real time about a project that was just completed, then that likely will involve your interaction with others on that project or your responsibility in particular deliverable within that project compared to the group. Employees are going to feel more valued throughout the process and they're going to be more, vote, more motivated because it's not waiting until the end of the year to have what tends to be a more highly stressful conversation to see how you did, you know, when you messed up three or six months ago in the, in the performance year, and you provide more support, it's an opportunity for you to have a discussion course correct rather than wait to the end of a performance year to say, well, next time, next year going in, you know, maybe the bonus will be uh, higher had you done this, rather than the opportunity to course correct and that not be the case at the end of the year. And obviously this is gonna help if employees are feeling more valued, more motivated, more supported, and there's an opportunity for more development. They're gonna have, um, your organizations will have a bigger employee retention rate, right? So there won't be as much effort needed to try and keep employees to stay, get employees to stay. They will be doing that on their own through the opportunities that are being provided um, in the workplace and, and career growth opportunities that are that are provided there. This, this process also allows for clarity, right? So for expectations, if you're doing something well, you know that in real time and you can continue that behavior. If there's mediocre or less than stellar performance that needs to be improved, you have the opportunity to improve that. Um, from managers and direct reports, they can agree on work standards, not just you set your goals at the beginning of the year, and then, you know, your manager helps you to align those goals with what your group or department is responsible for. And if those throughout the year change, you have the opportunity in these discussions to adjust how you're attaining that goal or maybe the metric of that goal rather than, oh, waiting again to the end of the year to say, um, maybe next year we'll, we'll need to have adjusted that because that would have been um, better. So it's giving you real time to do that. And then obviously from a leadership perspective, not only for those who manage individuals now, but for those potentially moving into those leadership positions, having the opportunity to coach and develop um, and build those skills as a, as a manager and a supervisor and a leader within your organization, not only with your direct report, but others in your department as you move up in the organization. 
So another great quote related to this, if we move on to the next slide. We can't just sit back and wait for feedback to be offered, particularly when we're in a leadership role. If we want feedback to take root in the culture, we need to explicitly ask for it. Ed Batista. So what are some challenges of moving to a continuous feedback model? Well, if it's rolled out too quickly or too early, earlier than an organization is ready, it can be unsuccessful. It may not be immediate. It may kind of stagger or get delayed throughout the process when rolling it out, or it could be it's rolled out, you go through a year, and it just it doesn't work out. So you want to be mindful that you're not just simply because that's what's trending and someone has made a decision that this organization that you're in is going to be on trend. You want to make sure that this is really a right fit for your organization for where you are now. Um, making sure that you have a real understanding that this isn't for everyone and that if you're at a one-time annual end-of-year performance review session now, a model there, then moving to quarterly may be too big of a jump for you. It may be that moving to semi-annually is the next great move. If you're at a semi-annual process now where you're doing a mid-year review and an end-of-year review, quarterly could be the next good step. It could be monthly. It really just depends on the the, the culture and the fit of your organization, and we'll talk about um, some, some top tips there shortly. And really employees making sure that um, employees, whether it's from an employee or supervisor perspective, don't see this as we're simply adding more meetings in, which means more documentation. That often is times where you won't get a lot of folks on side and really bought into moving into this model because the process now, even though it's once a year, tends to be too arduous. And so adding more times in the year where that will be the case isn't something that you're going to get a lot of champions with. Right, so making sure that you're focusing on throughout your training and, and documentation and um, discussion on this topic and the potential to move into this model, that it's really about focusing on the relationships and the feedback discussions rather than simply adding more pieces of paper to add to your personnel file. And then really continuing to focus on um, those, those conversations as and when making feedback a habit, not simply um, just more time throughout the year to add in. So if we move forward to the next slide. Well, I, I, we've got a couple of case studies here. Um, we'll, I'll talk about a few and I'll have Jeremy um, mention a few. These first two that I'll mention are um, organizations within the nonprofit sector. And, and in this one organization, they started with a very structured, centralized process managed by HR once a year at the end focused on the documentation and performance review to put into the personnel file so that that documentation going forward throughout their tenure is included. But this organization had a very progressive and forward-thinking leader that saw that this is a trend that's coming up and decided that their organization would be best placed to move to a continuous feedback model. They surveyed employees to see about their satisfaction with moving to this process and what that would look like. And they went through a very exhaustive and comprehensive training session, first with all staff, then they did a voluntary one-to-one um, -one coaching with certain individuals that were interested. And they moved to a decentralized process that wasn't necessarily managed by HR, um, but managed by the employees and the supervisors, scheduling those discussions on a quarterly basis depending on what was going on for them in their departments in their, um, in their work. And then after rolling out this new process, employees were surveyed again after 18 months, and there were a number of learnings. Um, it was fairly successful. Um, all of the employees, for the most part, really liked the, um, really liked the process, but they um, felt that there definitely needed to be a bit more one-to-one -one training, and that was decided that that voluntary aspect of it was no longer required. Um, so that was really a very deliberate, um, detailed, they didn't go fast through this transition, and it worked well. You know, they're moving along nicely in this quarterly model, and, and that worked well for this organization. The next organization in the case study that we have decided that if you move on to the next slide, decided that their annual review process at the end of the year 
um, was not something that across the board employees enjoyed, didn't think that there was much point to it, were not checked into it. It was a very arduous, drawn out process. And so leadership decided to bring in external um, consultants to assess and overhaul the process. Leadership as well as the employees below leadership level were surveyed separately to discuss what they enjoyed, what they liked about the process, what they didn't like, where there were gaps. Proposals were provided, a separate employee committee from different levels and different departments of the organization were taken, um, were uh, taken into effect and they had a committee set up that worked with the external consultants. Um, and then over the course of several months, uh, a new process was designed by the employees with the consultants. It was approved by leadership. Several months in, um, discussions and training took place with all staff across the board. Leadership and the wider staff were involved across all levels. Training was going well. Unfortunately, in this organization, the go live for rolling out the new process was delayed twice over six months. Then um, process hasn't hasn't changed a couple of years later because there was adjustment in leadership. They didn't really have the champions bought in from the beginning um, and throughout the process. And then because there were other higher priorities at the time, um, because the, the, the inclusion of this being incorporated with other organizational level priorities, this unfortunately dropped to the bottom. So in this case, it didn't work and they ended up sticking with the annual review process model. So there are definitely some, some challenges and some learning to take away here and I'll move it over, I'll pass it back over to Jeremy so he can talk about another case study which isn't necessarily in the nonprofit sector, but definitely worth mentioning. Hi, thanks, uh, thanks Angelique. Yeah, so the third case study I'd like to share with you is an organization that did a really big transformation of their performance process. And um, it's one that I think has really strong lessons that we can all le learn from and really understand kind of what are some pitfalls, what are some challenges, what are some things to be thinking of. And they're doing it in a unique way that I don't think will really work for every organization, but it's something that I think that we should all kind of be paying attention to. Several of the trends that we've been talking about here really kind of revolve around the same theme, which is transparency, right? So performance management becoming more frequent also leads to more transparent conversations between managers and employees, more transparent conversations about the people's readiness in terms of their own performance and their own development and all, their own skills assessment. So talking and having more candid, frank conversations regularly between managers and employees so that managers can really understand kind of what any skill gaps might be, what are some learning deficiencies that might exist that you can help and guide and coach your employees to really improve upon so they can continue to be successful in the areas that they're strong in. Um, so this is a really interesting example. They, before, before changing their process, which they've just changed as of January of this year, so it's a new process that's been going um, in effect this year for their organization, but they tried it out, and this is something I would recommend. Whenever they tried out, they came up with their new process, they tried it out with a sample group within the organization for the last year previous to kind of rolling it out to everyone. And I think that's when um, something that I, and Angela can probably agree with me, that I have found has been really instrumental with organizations I've found that have been successful in their performance management process changes. First of all, they figure out what the change should look like, then they test it on a group of employees first or a group of um, people in the organization or maybe a, a, an entire, you know, functional area to see kind of really, again, um, does it work? Do people like it? Do managers and employees respond well to it? Um, do they like the frequency of feedback, et cetera? So this organization had the standard annual review, that one time per year where people sit down and talk about their performance over the year. And it really was kind of seen internally as punitive. People didn't want to go to it. They were procrastinating about having these kinds of conversations. Both managers and employees were, right? They found no true intrinsic value out of the process. And oftentimes it, people came away feeling disengaged rather than kind of empowered. So again, the conversations should be shifting towards thinking about development. But this organization also really had no other feedback mechanism in place. It really was strictly the manager's vantage point of any given employee's performance. So what they wanted to really shift that model away from is not only having the manager be that kind of catch-all, if you will, but being able to incorporate lots of different feedback avenues. I mean, I think we're all, I mean, it could, could say there are instances in our, in our jobs and where we have a lot of things going on every day, a lot of competing priorities. We may, you know, jump over and help out someone here, help out someone there, do parts of, um, uh, you know, uh, of our a day to help, help on projects that maybe 
our manager is completely unaware of, right? So being able to have these other sources of feedback, these social feedback mechanisms where the managers collect feedback throughout the year from people, um, you know, that are peers to their employees, whether they be working next to them side by side every day or whether they jump around on different projects and help people out all the time throughout the day. But having some kind of social formalized feedback mechanism where, again, the manager is going to get you know, input from lots of different sources. And then that performance of that employee can be substantiated again by other different sources as well. So this organization also had a really, really specific um, rating scale. It had a seven point rating scale. So seven being the highest level of performance, one being the lowest. And they had a really, really complex calculation about how they got to what someone's final rating score could be. Um, it was based on social feedback from other people. It was based on, um, you know, their uh, metrics of deliverables that they were do doing with their clients. It was based on how many hours they were putting into a certain project. It was based on how they're managing the project in terms of financial metrics or meeting milestones and things like this. So all these different inputs came into this really complex calculation. So let's say Angelique and I have the same boss, and maybe her calculation at the end of the year is 7.46 and mine is 7.45. So she's 0 .1, 0 .01, excuse me, better than me in terms of our performance calculation, but how does a manager really sit down and explain to Angelique and I what the difference in that is, right? There was no real way for the manager to articulate the variance there. And so they were like, you know, this is too complex. We're really getting nothing out of these calculations. We're really getting no true barometer of, of, um, uh, of really how someone truly is performing because we're making it so specific in terms of the metrics we use and in terms of the math that we're using to calculate someone's performance. So what we really need to be focusing on is, you know, how they're doing in terms of increasing their skills, how they're doing in terms of increasing their development, and having managers be able to check in with them regularly and say, you know, maybe you're having problems, you know, with time management in this project. How can we help you do better in that way? Okay, great. Here are some content. Here are some learning activities. And here are some skill development that we can assign to you or share with you so you can kind of get better at that. So the idea, again, is talking about not maybe where someone might need some, you know, additional course correction, where someone might need some additional learning, and incorporating that into the conversation frequently throughout the year, and then having managers coach and direct their employees towards the learning content and the ways they can enhance those skills. They can get better. So again, you're seeing performance conversations happen more frequently in tandem with that course correction and in tandem with directed learning and directed abilities for people to really take advantage of development and really be take, you know, kind of an entrepreneurial ownership attitude towards their own development, towards their own career trajectory and towards their own, at the end of the day, performance. So what this organization has decided to do is to do five conversations throughout the year, one each quarter, so a quarterly check-in. And then one more formal conversation kind of at the end of the year where it's an umbrella conversation that catches kind of let's talk about how you did over the course of the whole year. So it's kind of a let's you know check in regularly throughout the year these four times, but then let's take a step back and talk about how you've improved and how your trajectory has changed based on all those four conversations that we had throughout the year. So as you have been, you know, highlighted to you some areas for you to really improve upon or really to focus on, did you take advantage of that coaching? Did you take advantage of those learning and development opportunities? And can we show a clear and measurable improvement in your performance based on those actions? So again, checking in one time per quarter, and what they're doing is something that's pretty unique, and I'm gonna share uh, their illustration here on the next slide, but they're using a nine box. Um, and so for those of you familiar with the nine box, again, I'll share an illustration of it on the next slide, but it's oftentimes used for succession planning, right? So it's usually to understand people's performance and their potential and highlight who your high potential employees are so you can think about readiness for them to step to the next level. But they decided to incorporate that into their conversations. So let's say you've got the first, you know, chunk of the year, that first quarter, and you're going to sit down with your employee and kind of plot them on this nine box. Then that second check-in, um, you're going to basically have an informal conversation. How, last time we talked about what specific development opportunities are for you, what specific direction we can give you in terms of learning. Here's the things that you need to be focusing on. And then let's see how you're doing. Do I need to give you any additional support? Do I need to, you know, kind of nudge you in the right way as your manager? Do I need to coach you in any given way? Or you as an employee, do you still feel like the, the um, you know, the, the feedback I gave you last quarter is relevant? Then in that third quarter, they'll do a nine box evaluation again. So 
two times per year, they're kind of checking in where people sit in this nine box. And then the other two times of the year, they're having these informal conversations that really track progress. And the, where they sit on the nine box determines kind of, you know, how they're going to be reviewed at the end of the year in terms of their rating and any kind of salary increase they may get. So this is what their nine box looks like. And for those of you familiar with it, um, sorry, for those of you unfamiliar with the nine box, it's basically two axes, right? You've got one axis for potential. So you're either below your potential, you're meeting your potential, or you're exceeding your level of potential. And one is for performance. So you're below your performance, you're meeting your standard level of performance, or you're exceeding performance. And you've got all the different spectrum in that continuum in between. So in the top right corner, this organization calls their people their strategic stars, right? And in the bottom left corner, these are the low performers. And as you'll see in the numbers underneath each of these titles, they translate into a five-point rating scale based on someone's performance. This is, well, this is the rating that you'll get at the end of the year that will determine your uh, salary rewards or your salary increase. So again, if you're that top person, um, you kind of know exactly that you're at, you're at the peak of your performance, you're at the peak of your potential. So these are the people this organization have highlighted and said, okay, you know what? They are performing really, really well. These are our rising stars. These are our people that we really want to make sure that we are retaining. And so what's also next for them? So let's talk with these people about what do they see next for them um, in terms of their career, in terms of their own learning and development opportunities. And then on the, on the far end of that spectrum, the people who are the low performers, they have very clear and prescribed um, activities for people in each of these boxes. So let's say um, Angelique is my manager and she has rated me a low performer in that bottom left corner, but I want to kind of slowly be pushed and move up to that center quadrant, right? Adaptable key professional. So Angelique, as, her man as my manager, would know exactly what the steps are this organization has defined them to me, for me to move up in my performance or my potential, right? So if you want to get here, here are the prescri prescription uh, sort of prescribed activities that I want to give you. Here's how I can coach you to make sure that you get where you need to be. And then again, they tr do this twice a year, so they're tracking people's movement in this box and in these axes of potential and performance. So performance, you know, you're going to have lots of different metrics that you can say what it means to be successful and what it means for someone to be performing well in their role. Uh, potential is a little bit more of a squishy thing, if you will. It's not something you can really quantify and really, you know, and really um, put in terms of how are you measuring what someone's potential is. So a lot of organizations are using really self-directed learning and innovation as the two main areas that you can measure someone's potential. So is someone coming to their job every day and really thinking about kind of out-of-the-box creative ways to go about solving a problem? Is someone taking ownership of their own learning, of their own career, of their own development? And so those are ways that you can measure potential and you can figure out, you know, of course, what that means within your organization. But really, this organization has, again, come up with specific guidelines around what it means to be performing well, what it means to have high potential and transcribe those into each of these quadrants. And again, they're using these twice a year and then uh, two other times a year, they're checking in and seeing how people are progressing along these milestones and along these trajectories. So they're having these conversations again, four times a year as these quick pulse checks and to say, okay, how are you doing here? How are you doing here? And then let's talk about how you can do better in this area, how you can do better in that area. Here are some ways that I as your manager can coach you um, here are some things that you can do by yourself as an employee. And then let's check in the next quarter to see, are you responding to the way I've coached you as your manager? And I'll also, are you taking, um, you know, ownership and accountability for your own role and increasing your performance in that way? So I want to take a real quick stop here and do another polling question and check the, um, you know, check what our audience has to say. But as we are thinking about these case studies, and as we're thinking about moving into a more kind of idea towards continuous feedback, we want to ask of our organizations who are thinking about moving in that direction, do you have a strategy in place right now to make sure that your organization really is focused on continuous feedback? So please answer uh, A, that you definitely do have a strategy in place. Uh, or B, you've got a feedback process in place already, so you're doing this continuous feedback, but there's not really a strategy to it, right? So maybe you're doing it, but you don't really have a true vision around kind of what the end, end goal is here. Or are you developing a new strategy, transitioning between your current strategies right now, you've got no strategy or some kind of other. So if you don't mind, uh, you'll see the box here on the right of your screen for selecting your answer choice, and then at the bottom of that white box, you'll see a gray box that says submit, so please go ahead and um, give us your feedback there, please. 
in a moment, we should be able to see the results. Okay. So basically, um, in, by another survey from Burson, by the way, we'll see that essentially uh, the biggest input here is that most organizations don't have a clear strategy right now. 35% of organizations don't have a strategy. Of those that are kind of, you know, in between or in the flux here, 25% are developing a strategy right now, 15% transitioning between strategies, and 17% are saying, you know what, we've got a feedback process in place but there is no clear strategy. So let's take a moment here and really think about that, right? So if you have a current feedback process in place, whether it be from other peer groups of your employees, other project team members, um, more continuous feedback between managers and employees, whatever that feedback process is in place, it's great to get feedback from lots of different inputs as you assess someone's, uh, you know, assess someone's kind of performance over the year. But think about the strategy of that process. Is there a point to it? And have you clearly defined and articulated that point? And that leads us to kind of really step one in thinking about whether you are ready to transition to a continuous feedback process. Diagnose the process that you've got in place right now. So some things you wanna think about really, do you have stated objectives of your appraisal program? Do you have kind of a clear vision, a clear strategy? Why are we doing this in the first place? Is there a way to show what the point of it all is? Is there a way to show that once we know that what that point is, that we're meeting that point, right? So do we have objectives? Are we meeting the objectives of the program? And if you don't have that in place right now, let's figure out before you move to any new kind of feedback loop mechanism, whether it be quarterly, twice per year, monthly, whatever, what's the point of the process, right? So make sure you can clearly identify and articulate that because if you roll out a program from the HR group in your organization, oftentimes managers and employees within your organization are gonna think, okay, it's another process for the sake of a, a process, right? It's another process being rolled out by HR, and they may roll their eyes at it. We want to get away from that. We want to make sure that we can clearly articulate why we're doing something, and then, of course, understand and incorporate our employees and managers satisfied with the process right now as it stands. So getting their feedback into the process, what's working, what's not working, is truly critical. Um, again, you don't want to have a, you know, another program rolled out from HR and just kind of have, you know, employees like, you know, grin and bear it or roll their eyes at it. You want to bring them to the table. And organizations I've found who have changed their performance review process, changed the continuous feedback model, have really taken into account what managers and employees are saying. Because, again, they're the ones who are living and breathing the process um, on the, at the, as the end user, if you will. So getting their perspective, getting their feedback, getting their seat at the table is great. So we want to make sure that you always continually do that. And also articulate, do you, do you know what the benefits of your process are? Do they outweigh the cost? So if you're putting in a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy into your performance management process, are you able then to see results at the end of it? Are you able to track the improvement in employee performance and, you know, the, the organizational performance by um, enacting these processes? And if not, then what are we doing it for, right? So are we truly articulating what the, what the reason is, what the benefits are, have there, and can you track if there are improvements in your uh, performance, not only of your employees, but also of your organization as a whole? And if you can't do that, before you change to any process, Maybe you should take a step back and think about how to best do that and what's the point, how you can articulate that point, and how you can measure if you're being successful in the first place. And then, of course, discern what the end result should be. So, again, are you being able to truly understand if the attitudes and behaviors of your employees and managers are changing in the way that you want them to go? So, before you change to any kind of program, think about, all right, what, is, what are our employees and managers think of it right now? And then as we change it, or do they like it better? So always do those pulse checks. Always check in with employees and managers who are, again, the living, breathing, you know, um, end users of any process. And we want to make sure that, again, if they're not responding well to it, if they hate doing it, they're not going to get anything out of it. They're not going to get any kind of engagement out of it. And that's the point. That's what we want to do. So, again, make sure that you focus on that and that you can really, you know, just definitely identify the signs of results for uh, the signs of performance results, right? So can you track and can you, um, you know, really be able to measure increases and changes in people's behavior and make sure that you've, you know, captured all of those types of um, aspects. So the third thing I'd like to ask everybody is, 
do you feel like your organization right now is ready to jump on, jump into and implement a continuous feedback performance model? So are you able to step it up maybe from semi-annually to quarterly or from once per year to twice per year? So do you think right now that your organization is ready to do that? So we'll start here and ask another quick polling question. So either yes, you think you're ready, no, you don't think you're ready, or right now you're in development of, of a program or you're not sure. So if you don't mind taking a moment here and again, select your answer here on the right-hand side of the screen and then select submit at the bottom. And we'll see what our results here are. Just a few more seconds here as people will finish answering the poll results. We appreciate your um, participation in these poll questions. It's good for us to kind of get a sense of not only what our audience is in terms of market, in terms of what we see everybody else is in the trends, but also kind of get a quick sense of, um, you know, not only maybe how the debt may differ from general industry to nonprofits. All right, and it looks like um, it says, most of our organizations um, are saying, you know, essentially that you are in development of a program, you're not sure if you're ready or you're not ready at all. That's the bulk of it. So very few of our respondents really say, yeah, we're ready for it. So essentially at the end of the day, most people, and I think this is true across all organizations I've worked with, that you're a little bit trepidatious, you're a little bit unsure, you know that this is maybe the right direction to go in, but you're not sure really how to do that best. So we have some questions for you to consider as you think about moving in that general direction. So. As you think about maybe moving into a continuous feedback model, as you think about whether or not you're ready to do so, here's some questions I want you to really sit back and think about with the team of your, of, of your peers who are kind of maybe spearheading this internally, or if you go to your HR leaders or, or your organizational leaders and say, you know, we, we think we need to do this. We know it's the right way to go. We know that feedback um, is important and having it more frequently throughout the year will only increase engagement, will only increase, you know, um, the ability for us to understand who our top talent is and to make course corrections. We know this is the right thing to do, but really we, let's talk about first of all and get a, get a sense of where we sit right now. So where, where are we doing a good job of? Where maybe we need to reconsider everything from scratch? What are our employees like? What are our managers like? What are some of the problems with their own performance review process? Really think about that. Understand what the problems are, but not only from our perspective as HR people, but the people out there who are, again, managers and employees who are living and breathing the process every day. Do you understand how to measure performance and success? Do you have an idea of what your version of continuous feedback would look like? Would it be better for your organization to do it twice a year, four times a year? What do you think would be the best and most palpable thing, palpable change uh, for your organization? And also, not the best change, but that would show the best results, right? So if you think that, you know, you can do it twice a year, you can see and measure results and the way people change their behavior um, in every six months, fine. If you think it's better for you to do it quarterly and really kind of be more um, engaged with your employees in that way, Fine, it's really truly a cultural assessment of what's going to work best for your employees, what's going to work best for your organization, but also what drives high performance in your organization. Do you know what that is? And that's another reason to take a quick pulse check, get stakeholders at the table and understand really from their perspective, what is performance? What is high performance? What does that look like? What does success look like? And then have a process and a, a people management process in place to guide in that direction. Again, that's the whole point of these continuous feedback conversations is to drive better performance for our employees. And how can you foster that with your review process is truly the question that you all need to think about. There are no right answers to these questions, but they're questions that you need to think about in terms of what's going to work best for your organization and making sure that you have articulated answers to each of these questions will help you be even more successful as you try to make any change to your performance management process. And then if you think about what are truly the next steps, if you walk away from this webinar today and think, how are we going to enact a continuous feedback model in our organization? What do I even do to get started, right? First of all, we want to think about you need a team around you to really understand the performance management process and understand kind of, again, the feedback that you're going to get and the input you're going to get from a variety of sources. So not only the people who are, you know, managing it from an HR or project perspective, how easy is it for them to administer the performance review process all throughout the year? How easy is it for them to administer continuous feedback? Is that going to be something that they 
can handle? And if so, what's the way that that's going to look successful for them, but also for employees and managers alone, right? I mean, alike, they're going to be the ones, again, living and breathing it. What's it like for a manager to have more conversations with employees? Can you give them a toolbox of the kinds of questions to ask their employees? Can you give them a toolbox, toolbox of, all right, if I'm seeing someone who's performing um, in a way that I would like to improve, how do they then coach them to make sure that improvement gets better? What are some directed activities they can, you know, prescribe to their employees to be able to measure performance as it changes, but also for employees. They want to feel empowered in their own career. They want to have new learning opportunities available to them. So are you able to make sure that you have had those available for people and that you're developing your leaders and you're giving them the opportunity to learn and enhance their skills in demand, um, on demand and then re in real time? You want to review all this input that you're getting from all these different sources and establish the goals of your program. So you know what people like, you know people don't like, you know what's really going to be uh, effective for your organization by getting these sources um, and, and have provide their input, but then figure out what are the goals? What is the point of your program? And make sure that you articulate those clearly. They're easy to uh, translate to other people so that managers and employees alike can really readily understand the goals of your program without having to do a lot of extra research or extra feedback, right? You want it to be very simple. Um, and I think there's a really good analogy here. And if you think about, you know, using Facebook or, or Instagram, right? These are social media uh, um, applications. If you go on to start using them, right? No one needs training about how to use Instagram. No one needs training about how to use Facebook. You log in and it's pretty intuitive. So your program should all be that intuitive. If you have to go through a lot of different training, a lot of different explanation about how to do a process, uh, for people who are not, you know, really truly learning and development professionals, maybe they're managers, they're, they're employees, they just want the results of the program, they want to know how they're performing and how to do better. If that can't be easily explained and easily articulated, then the program that you've got in place is ineffective and figure out how to make it as intuitive and as clear as possible for the people who are, again, implementing these new approaches and who are um, living, breathing, living and breathing the process all the time. And as you implement any new approach, you always want to think about how to iterate that program and how to improve that program. So that leads to if you change a program, maybe you should think about changing it within a small sample group in your organization first, see how it works, work out any kinks, and figure out what they like, what they don't like before you roll it out to your whole organization. Again, that's when I've seen most uh, organizations who've changed these process processes be most successful is they're saying, okay, we figure out maybe what we think is going to work, but let's try it here with, with this group first and really understand what they think works and what they don't think doesn't work because what we think may work as program designers may not always be um, the case on the ground, so to speak. So um, the, iterate those programs, improve those programs. And by the way, performance management is not an end destination. It's always a changing, changing, and reiterative process. So just because you roll out one program doesn't mean that's your program for life. So think about always iterating, always improving on the program, figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Just because something's working this year doesn't mean it's going to work in three or four years. So always kind of think about this mindset of how do we get better because the idea of continuous performance, continuous feedback, continuous improvement is not just for the process. It's for all of us, um, and regardless of our, of our engagement in that process. So with that, I want to stop and say thank you and um, check in with Rachel, who's our moderator today, and see if we have any questions we can field from the audience. Wonderful. Yes, now it's time for Q&A. Um, if you do have additional questions, please type them into the Q&A box, um, and I will try to get to, to them. But we did get a number of very good questions during the webinar. Um, what should those continuous feedback engagement sessions with staff look like, whether they're monthly, quarterly, or otherwise? And Jeremy, can yeah, you hear you me? Me take, yeah, okay, sorry, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. So, <laughs> sorry. So, um, what, what, what should those questions, what, what should those conversations look like? That's a great, uh, that's a great question. So, I will say, and I'm going to harken back to the third um, uh, case study that we reviewed today. They do it quarterly, and I like their, their approach in that two of them are very formal conversations, right? We're going to talk about what your skill gaps are. We're going to talk about, you know, what we can do in terms of setting milestones for you over the next six months, what we can do to make sure that we are tracking your, the increase of your performance. A lot of organizations we work with provide their managers with kind of a list of questions or a list of guiding principles about how to have those kinds of conversations if they feel like 
their managers may not be able to effectively do them or that there's a big cultural shift in your organization, right? So give them some kind of toolbox of a list of questions, a list of kind of themes or principles that you should be talking about. Have a formal conversation once every six months where you really kind of go through all the different steps of assessing someone's skills, assessing someone's performance, and then give them directed milestones to achieve. And then that do that every six months. And so let's say you do that in January and July. Well, in April and October, I'm still going to have conversations with my employees, but it's less formal. So there's no checklist, there's no real assessment, but it's really kind of a let's sit down and see, you know, how are you doing so far on what we talked about last month, last time we checked in. And you, we're three months into it, so you're halfway through before our next check-in. So what can I do to help you make sure that you've gotten to all your milestones, you've gotten kind of all your um, progress by the next time that we check in. That's a great way I think about, uh, I can think about doing it if you go in that quarterly approach, but having some kind of formal list of questions, some kind of formal list of um, uh, themes that you want to make sure that your managers are hitting on and asking and thinking about, and then maybe a check in after that just to kind of see how people are progressing in between. Um, and Angelique, do you have any response to that? Okay. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to go ahead and move on to the next one. I think this one actually might be okay. well suited for Angelique. Um, another question we had for those of us that don't have an enterprise wide performance management process, do you believe that moving to these models is possible um, with more upfront work, or does it require a traditional model first? Angelique? I'm sorry, Angelique, we can't hear you. Would you like me to take that, Rachel? Uh, yes, please. Okay, sure, no problem. So I would say you don't have to have a traditional model in place first. I think you can go directly into these continuous feedback processes. Um, I think, you know what, that may even be better for you because I think oftentimes the people who have a traditional model in place changing to this continuous feedback model is too much of a cultural change right away. But if you don't have anything in place already, then starting something like this from scratch is only going to really ingratiate these ideas and ingratiate this idea of continuous feedback and continuous performance um, you know, improvement into your culture. And I think that's the great way to kind of start. So yeah, I don't, would not say that you have to have a traditional program in place before you can kind of move into one of these directions. Okay, wonderful. Um, and it looks like we do have uh, time for another question. Um, the next one I have is, my company is a national company and corporate sets when evaluations are done. What is the best way to help my supervisor in my area approach a continuous feedback on employee performance appraisals on a regular basis without violating company policy? Right. So you know what? A lot of our organizations do have company that we work with do have company policy where you have to have that mandated one time per year and that mandated let's give you a, a rating, right? Um, and oftentimes this is going to work. Uh, these, these are mandated that they have to be done due to your federal contractor or you have a unionized uh, labor force or collective bargaining agreement with certain employee groups. So in the stipulations of those contracts and the stipulations of those agreements, oftentimes that's the case. You have to have that and you have to go through that process. So, and even if it's company mandated, you know, you've got to do that. But without, even without the mandate of having it more frequently throughout the year, you can absolutely still fit this into um, the annual review process. And I would advise making sure that whenever you have more frequent conversations, you bring, you document those in a way in whatever format that looks like for you, whether it be an online provider, um, a talent management provider, or, you know, even documenting it in Word and Excel, just have some way to formalize the documentation of what those conversations look like, what progress looks like that you're tracking between conversations so that you can then assess that and assess someone's trajectory, assess someone's ability to kind of take feedback and then act and capitalize on that by making course corrections in their behavior, by engaging in new learning and development activities. But at the end of the year, then you've got all these notes that you've collected throughout the rest of the year that you can really rely on and hang your hat on and say, I don't have to rely on my memory over the course of the last year and just kind of remembering what this person is doing. I've got it documented because we are talking more frequently throughout the year and I've got that to kind of, you know, be 
uh, a true guide and true assessment um, vehicle for those overarching conversations and those overarching ratings you may have to give at the end of, of any given year. All right, fantastic. Um, okay, it looks like unfortunately Angelique has lost audio. So um, we uh, are ending in our time as it is. So I did want to thank everyone uh, for your participation in our webinar today. Uh, before you log off, please take a moment to complete the event evaluation, which will appear on your screen in a few moments. Your comments and suggestions are very important and help us provide you with programs like this one in the future. Uh, just as a reminder, the uh, certification codes for attending today will be available in the event follow-up email along with the recording uh, and the slides. So those should go out in the next couple of days. Uh, this does conclude today's program. Have a wonderful day. You may now disconnect. <laughs>